This video was made possible thanks to your support on Patreon. Subscribe on Patreon for early access to videos and additional content. Welcome to Cold Case Detectives Too Close to Home, a monthly series where we select five patrons at random and examine cases related to their hometowns. If you'd like to see your hometown featured, you can support the channel on Patreon by following the link below. And now let's dive in with five cases from your hometowns. The mysteries that strike too close to home. Jonathan Matondo. This case comes from an anonymous patron who chose the location of Sheffield, England. 16-year-old Jonathan Matondo was described by his uncle as a good boy with an excellent sense of humor when his life came to an abrupt end in the winter of 2007. For years, Jonathan had been a regular churchgoer who aspired to become a preacher, but all that changed when he became involved with a local Sheffield gang known as S3 who got their name from their postcode. The gang had been feuding with a rival group named S4 for several years when Jonathan became embroiled in a life of crime. He stopped dreaming of becoming a preacher and began to skip church visits. Instead, he plans to become a rapper. On the streets, he was known as Venomous and Vendog and would often carry both a gun and a blade. At the time of his death, he was serving a supervision order for robbery. On Wednesday, October 17th, 2007, 16-year-old Jonathan was walking through a park near a child's playground in the Burn Grieve area of Sheffield when he was shot dead. A bullet was fired from a distance of around 60 feet by a weapon with a red laser device attached to it. This helped the perpetrator accurately aim. The single shot struck the teenager in the head. His body was discovered behind a baseball court shortly afterwards. As police began to investigate, they discovered that Jonathan had been affiliated with the S3 gang. The same weapon used to kill the teenager had been used two months before to fire shots at the home of another S3 gang member. Both the S3 and S4 gangs had been responsible for a series of gun attacks and stabbings in the city, particularly in the Burnsgreave and Pittsmore areas with the police compiling a dossier of 38 incidents by the time Jonathan's case went to trial. According to the residents of Burngreave, hours before the murder occurred, one group chased another into a nearby park, firing shots as part of an ongoing gun battle. Jonathan had been speaking with his girlfriend, Siobhan, at the time. She heard a gunshot, followed by a friend of Jonathan's shouting, Come on, Venomous! Run! Run! He replied, I'm not running for no one. No one is trying to bust shots at us. The friend responded with, don't stop, keep running. Siobhan then heard a big crash before the line went dead. A witness at the time reportedly saw five hooded males running after Jonathan. They had guns in their waistbands. The detectives who worked on Jonathan's case at the time firmly believe that numerous individuals were involved with the crime and that his murder was part of a pre-planned plot stating that Jonathan was targeted and ruthlessly killed in an organized and planned attack. They uncovered that the teenager had told a friend of his that in the days before his death, he had either stabbed or slashed somebody in a nightclub called The Vibe, located in Sheffield city center. Furthermore, investigators believed that Jonathan had been targeted in retaliation for a shooting at a house belonging to the relatives of an S4 member the night before his death. Just a few hours before he was shot in the head, an attempt was made on the 16-year-old's life while he visited a friend's flat on Melrose Road in Pittsmoor. The attempt was a failure, leading to this second effort. In the year following Jonathan's demise, 19-year-old Negus Nelson was arrested and put on trial twice. A member of the S4 gang, Nelson's aunt and uncles were the relatives whose house had been targeted the day before Jonathan was killed. During Nelson's first trial, the jurors could not agree on a verdict. Nelson denied being the shooter, 
but had been found with firearm residue on his clothing when he was arrested for the first time just two days after the murder. He claimed that he'd come into contact with a lot of people, and the residue could have come from anywhere. Furthermore, Nelson is of Afro-Caribbean origin, but has light skin, as he has albinism. Jonathan told his girlfriend that the man who had fired on him earlier on the day he was killed was, quote, albino-looking, white man, proper white, but black. Nelson was tried again in late 2008, where he was found not guilty and cleared of involvement. In 2018, now aged 29, Nelson was jailed for 16 months along with three other men after fights broke out in a Sheffield nightclub and several men were stabbed. In the years since Jonathan's death, no one else has been arrested or tried for the murder. Following the crime, Jonathan's mother left Sheffield. She had come to the UK when her son was just six years old to escape a civil war in the Democratic Republic of Congo. At the time, Sheffield had been considered one of the United Kingdom's safest cities, and the ruthless murder of 16-year-old Jonathan sent shockwaves through the community. The local police force promised to relentlessly pursue the perpetrator, but so far, Jonathan's case remains unsolved. If you have any information about Jonathan's murder, you can contact Crime Stoppers anonymously on 0800 555 one. Layla Adkins. Our next case comes from the city of Leeds, located in the US state of Alabama. Our patron, Lisa, originally chose the city of Helena in the same state. However, we were unable to find a suitable case in this area, so we broadened our search and discovered an unsolved missing persons case just half an hour away in Leeds. Described by her loved ones as eccentric and artistic, Layla Adkins was a passionate writer with a love for magical creatures, especially fairies, whose life had taken a difficult turn at the time of her disappearance in the late 2000s. The 32-year-old mother of two was last heard from on November 13th, 2008. At the time, she was living with a male housemate who'd moved in during September of that year in the 11,200 block of Highway 41 in Shelby County. The exact nature of the pair's relationship is unclear to both authorities and Layla's family. She wrote in a letter to her eldest daughter, who was 13 when her mother disappeared, that he treated her very well and she planned to cook him a Thanksgiving dinner. In the letter, dated shortly before she went missing, Layla also stated that she was looking for a new job and planned to visit the hospital soon for treatment for a spider bite. It wasn't until January 21st of 2009, just over two months after she was last heard from, that Layla was reported missing by her brother and sister-in-law, David and Lee Blizzard, who lived in North Carolina. Lee thought of the 32-year-old as a sister due to their closeness. Layla's sudden disappearance was uncharacteristic. Although she struggled with substance abuse issues, she called her relatives once a week and made arrangements to visit them at least once a month. Her daughters, 13-year-old Caitlin and an unnamed daughter who was six at the time, lived with separate family members. Layla had lost custody of the children due to her drug abuse problems. According to her family, the 32-year-old had a pattern of living with family members for a few months as she tried to get clean, and then leaving so she could move in with a new boyfriend. After she was reported missing, authorities in Shelby County approached her home to find it unoccupied. It was empty of Layla's belongings, and her housemate was nowhere to be found. They eventually traced him to Huntsville, Alabama, after discovering he had moved there shortly after the mother of two vanished. The man claimed that Layla had moved out and that he thought she'd gone to Houston, Texas to be with a man whom she'd been speaking with over Facebook. However, when investigators spoke with this other individual, he reported that he hadn't seen Layla in years. Here, the case appears to grow cold. The same month Layla was reported missing, a warrant was issued for her arrest. She had previously pled guilty to theft and drug possession and had been given a conditional suspended sentence. She is still wanted for failing to comply with the terms of her sentence. According to Caitlin, who spoke with the Shelby County reporter in 2018, during the original investigation, polygraphs were issued to both Layla's first husband and her father, who Caitlin was living with at the time of her mother's disappearance. Layla's housemate, however, declined to take one. Of this unidentified man, 
Caitlin told the media, quote, I wish I knew more about him, but at this point, I don't know if I'll ever get that. He's just this mysterious person who nobody knows. At the time of this interview, investigators on Layla's case were looking to interview more people who may have been involved. However, little is known about these individuals or how they came to the attention of the police. Caitlin told the Shelby County reporter that her contact with the police is limited. She recalled that, at the time of the initial investigation, a DNA sample was taken from both her and her grandfather. Shortly afterwards, officers with the Cold Case Squad asked if her mother had mentioned going to Talladega, a city in Alabama. Caitlin told them she had not, and her mother generally told her everything. The original investigation also included out-of-state interviews and searches which were conducted with sniffer dogs, but Caitlin still feels that not enough effort was put into looking for her mother. Law enforcement claims they used all their available resources, but Layla's family feels differently, believing that because she had substance abuse issues, her disappearance was not deemed as important. Caitlin also shared light on her mother's personal life during this same interview noting that she had been through several traumatic events, which likely added to Layla's issues with drugs. She had reportedly been married to a man named Danny Adkins briefly. The couple separated in the space of a year, but couldn't afford to divorce. As of 2018, Danny was still legally married to Layla. He keeps an occasional contact with Caitlin, checking in, mostly with regards to any progress in the investigation. Following Danny and Layla's split, the mother of two began a relationship with a man who would go on to take his own life. Layla was the one who found the body. Then, afterwards, she dealt with a cancer scare, which was followed by her arrest for theft and drug possession. Layla did not have a car at the time of her disappearance, and her phone has not been used since she vanished on November 13th, 2008. Her case is still cold, and her family believes she may have overdosed on drugs, and her body was disposed of in a panic. Caitlin told the media, I think that scared her housemate, and all he thought to do was run. My mum wouldn't go a week without calling. It's been 10 years. She would at least come round to ask for money by now. Investigators believe that foul play may be involved in her disappearance. 32-year-old Layla Adkins was last heard from on November 13th, 2008. At the time, she was living in the 11,200 block of Highway 41, in Shelby County, Alabama. She is described as a white woman standing at 5 foot 11 and weighing around 120 pounds. She has blonde hair and blue eyes and normally uses her maiden name, Blizzard. Her ears are pierced and she has a tattoo on her left breast. Layla has a history of abusing prescription medication and other drugs and may be suffering from mental health issues. If she is still alive, she will be 46 years old. If you have any information about Layla's disappearance, you can call the Shelby County Sheriff's Office at 205 669 4181. Oliver Munson. This case is brought to us by our patron Abigail, who chose the location of Cattonsville, Maryland. At 7.50 on the morning of February 13th, 1984, 39-year-old Oliver Munson left his home on Orpington Road, located in Catonsville, Maryland, to head to work. Oliver was an industrial art school teacher at Ellicott City Middle School in Howard County and was always reliable and punctual. But despite leaving home, he never turned up to the school, causing both his students and colleagues to become concerned, especially since he never called in sick. He has never been seen or heard from again and was reported missing the following day. His brother, James, went to his house to check on him, but found it empty. He returned the day after and discovered that somebody had broken in and stolen Oliver's video equipment. It is unknown if the burglary is related to his disappearance. On February 16th, two days after he vanished, Oliver's 1980 Ford Pinto was found two blocks from his home. Parked on Brayside Road, the vehicle's right front tire was flat, and inside, investigators found his hat, notebook and lunch bag, but there was no sign of the car's owner and no indication as to where he might be. The vehicle's radio had been stolen. Oliver was described as a reclusive man, one of six siblings. He had graduated from the University of Maryland at East Shore before becoming a teacher. 
He was well liked by both his students and colleagues, and often took his pupils bowling and played softball with them after school. In his free time, he liked to work on old cars, and on most weekends he left town to visit family. He appeared to be an ordinary man with no known enemies, and his abrupt disappearance was most unusual. A fortnight passed before further progress was made in the case. On February 27th, the police were alerted by a man named Hilton Solomon that he had found some strange items in his car, which had reportedly been stolen back on February 13th, the day of the disappearance. According to Solomon, the car, which was a 1973 Datsun 240Z, had been found parked at the edge of Leakin Park in West Baltimore, and inside it, he had recovered two video store receipts with Oliver's name on them. When the police arrived to examine the vehicle, they discovered traces of human blood and a spent, small-caliber shell casing. While authorities were able to determine that the blood was type O positive, they were never able to concretely link it to Oliver. His blood type was unknown, and forensics were not advanced enough at that point to compare DNA. Although it was sent off for testing in later years, by that time, it had deteriorated too far to be tested. With this new evidence, investigators began theorizing that Oliver had been murdered for giving evidence against an automobile theft ring. In January of 1983, roughly a year before his disappearance, the school teacher had purchased a used classic Datsun 240Z, unaware that it had been stolen three months before. He bought the vehicle from a man named Dennis Watson, a garage owner who used his business to cover his chop shop, where he resold stolen cars or dismantled them for parts. Just two months after Oliver had purchased the Datsun, the police, who had been quietly watching and investigating Wilson for some time, raided the garage. Authorities found Oliver's name, with some of the paperwork taken from the scene, and asked him to testify against Wilson during his trial. Oliver agreed. He was scheduled to testify three days after he went missing. Notably, Dennis Watson is suspected of being involved in the death of another man who was set to testify against him. A decade earlier, a 29-year-old named Clinton Glenn was knocked unconscious before being burned alive in a car registered to Watson. Clinton was due in court the following day. Although there was a witness in this case, the witness died of a suspicious overdose before they were due to testify. As a result, the first-degree murder charge against Watson was dropped. Still, Oliver's lack of appearance in court did not stop Watson from going to jail for his part in the automobile theft. He pled guilty to the charges laid against him and was given 10 years behind bars, although he was paroled in 1989 after serving less than half his sentence. He was questioned about Oliver's disappearance, but maintained his innocence. After his release from prison, he disappeared, and his whereabouts are currently unknown. There are a few theories in Oliver's case. The main one was proposed by a detective who worked on the original investigation. He suggested that Oliver's tire was tampered with, which caused him to need to pull over. In this theory, Oliver was being tailed by several individuals who were driving Hilton Solomon's car and who offered him assistance. When he accepted, the 39-year-old sat in their passenger seat and was shot from behind by somebody sitting in the back. His body was then dumped or buried at Leakin Park. Another theory in the case was proposed by a friend of Oliver's, who stated that he often joked about leaving to start a new life. At the time of his disappearance, he was dealing with a breakup his school was facing closure, and his house had suffered severe damage after several water pipes had burst. However, the majority of Oliver's friends and families do not believe that he left of his own volition, and authorities think it's most likely that he met with foul play given the circumstances. In 1985, Oliver was declared legally dead. A judge ruled that he was the victim of a presumptive homicide. The case remains unsolved, and no other persons of interest or suspects have been made public. Oliver Munson was 39 when he went missing from Cattonsville, Maryland. He left his home on Orpington Road on the morning of February 13th, 1984, and was never seen or heard from again. Oliver is described as a black male with black hair and brown eyes. He is around 5 foot 6 to 5 foot 10 in height, and weighed between 150 and 160 pounds. His DNA is available for comparison. 
If he is still alive, he will be 77 years old. If you have any information about Oliver's disappearance, you can call the Baltimore County Police Department at 410-887-3943. Odin Jacobson. Our penultimate case this month comes from our patron Vegard, who chose the location of Trondheim, Norway. On November 18th, 2018, Dan and Ingun Jacobson, residents of Skaun, Norway, called the police to notify them that their son, 18-year-old Odin, had not returned home from a night out, and they were unable to contact him. The following day, they filed an official missing persons report. Almost four years later, Odin's whereabouts are still unknown. There are very few details in the media about Odin's last movements. On the evening of November 17th, he attended a party after completing a workout at the gym. Following this party, the teenager and a group of his friends traveled to Trondheim city center, where they would later be seen on CCTV at around 4.50 AM. Shortly afterwards, a group of friends minus Odin walked back in front of the CCTV. The 18-year-old friends would later tell investigators that Odin had parted ways with the group, telling them that he was going to get the bus home. Oddly, the next bus would not depart from Trondheim until after nine that morning. There's no evidence that the teenager was on this bus home. According to Odin's parents, they last heard from their son at 10.07 PM on the evening of the 17th. He asked his mother what time the buses were at and discovered there was one leaving at half past. His parents offered to collect him if need be. They called him a short while later, but he didn't answer and didn't text them again. Odin's father, Dan, drove to where they thought he was, but didn't see him and couldn't find him. Their panic intensified when he didn't come home that night or the following morning, leading to them notifying their local police department. It was later established that Odin's mobile phone had run out of battery at 11.30 PM on the night of his disappearance. When authorities explored Trondheim's CCTV footage further, they discovered that Odin had been captured on video walking around the city center on his own. He had been spotted on almost 10 different cameras. At 5.35 AM, he was seen on the footage breaking out into a brief run, almost as if he had spotted the camera and was trying to dash past it. Odin was seen once more at 5.44 AM, outside an apartment block where he was walking at a regular pace. It wasn't until December 1st that the first clues in Odin's case came to light. A passerby in Trondheim discovered the 18-year-old's bank card, bus card, passport, and mobile phone. The items had been neatly stacked next to a warehouse. As a result of this finding, authorities decided to search the rest of the area. The fire department assisted in the search of the water using boats, divers, and an underwater drone, while the Red Cross helped look on land for further clues. 400 feet from where Odin's belongings were found, investigators discovered more of his possessions. Inside a plastic bag, they recovered some of his workout clothing, a hat, and one of his shoes. CCTV in this area showed the 18-year-old at 6.01 AM, walking past where the items were found. This is the last confirmed sighting of Odin. The surveillance footage also revealed that somebody in a white station wagon backed up and parked near to where the items were found inside a storage container. The driver stepped out for a moment and looked around before driving off again. Five months later, on April 14th, 2019, a hiker notified the police that he had found partially burned clothing in a campfire by Lake Jonsvotnet, over 12 miles from Trondheim. Odin's parents confirmed that the clothing was his, and the items were those that had been missing from the plastic bag of belongings that had been found. A Norwegian crime show which covered the case suggested it was unlikely the 18-year-old had walked to the lake, stating it was much more feasible he had taken a bus or driven. As far as anybody knew, this was not a location which Odin frequented. In June of 2020, it was revealed that a farmer had come forward shortly after the teen's disappearance. He had reported that he'd seen Odin at the lake on November 19th, two days after he went missing. The man was standing at the side of a gravel road in the area when he saw a young man with long blonde hair and a yellow jacket walking towards him with his head down. As the young man passed, he looked up and smiled at the farmer, 
before looking down again and continuing on his way. The young man was not dressed for hiking, which struck the farmer as odd. About an hour and a half later, the farmer drove his tractor up the road in the direction the young man had been walking. He expected that he would catch up to the blonde man, but didn't. The farmer suspected he must have stepped off the road and into the woods. Allegedly, the police did not investigate this tip at the time. It wasn't until September of 2020 that they searched the area in which the farmer believed he saw Odin, although they found nothing to suggest the 18-year-old had been there. After a Norwegian crime show aired an episode on Odin's case, the authorities received numerous tips about the owner of the white station wagon that was seen in the vicinity of where his possessions were found. It turned out that the driver of the vehicle, a 40-year-old man, was somebody who had previously been interviewed by police. He was arrested and taken in for questioning, where he revealed that he had found Odin's belongings and taken them to the lake where he burned them. While he offered no explanation as to why he decided to burn the items, he claimed that he had panicked after finding they belonged to a missing teenager and had lied to the police during the first interview. While this man was questioned extensively and his house and cars were subject to rigorous police searches, there was no evidence that he was involved with Odin's disappearance. He was, however, charged with perjury. Over the course of the investigation, over 200 people have been interviewed by the police. Investigators have several theories that Odin vanished voluntarily, that he took his own life, or that he met with an accident. While foul play has not been fully ruled out, police believe it is unlikely as they have been unable to find any evidence to indicate Odin was harmed. The case is still unsolved. Odin Jacobson was 18 when he vanished from Trondheim city center. He was last seen alive on CCTV at 6.01 AM and has not been seen or heard from since. Odin is described as a white male who stands around six foot two and is of a slim build. He had shoulder length blonde hair at the time of his disappearance. If you have any information about Odin's disappearance, you can call the police tip line on 7348 9400. Erica Faith Hagen. Our final case this month comes from the city of Temuco in Chile. Our Patreon Rodolfo originally chose the city of Valdivia, but unfortunately, we were unable to find a case in this area, so we broadened our search and found a horrific unsolved murder in the city of Temuco. Erica Faith Hagen is remembered by those who knew her as a loving and compassionate young woman. Valedictorian at her high school graduation, Erica's tremendous efforts in her classwork and after-school activities paid off, and she obtained a scholarship to Georgetown College in Kentucky, where she studied psychology while minoring in Spanish. Born in Callaway, Kentucky in March of 1992, Erica was a loyal churchgoer who loved to meet new people and wanted to help shape the lives of the next generation. Aged 22, following her graduation from university, she moved to Chile after accepting a six-month job offer in Temuco, where she would teach English to secondary school children. A popular and well-liked woman, Erica seemed to fit in well. It was a devastating shock to all when she turned up dead a few months into her visit. On September 5th, 2014, Erica was discovered nude in her bathtub with three wounds to her head. She had suffered blunt force trauma after being struck with an object, and her bath water was scalding hot and had leaked into the school science lab next door. The 22-year-old had been living in an apartment on the campus of the school where she worked. According to investigators, there were no signs of forced entry, leading them to believe that Erica was killed by somebody she knew and had let into her home. Furthermore, it was discovered that somebody had attempted to set the apartment alight. Traces of fire were located in one area of the home. Soon, a fire poker found at the scene was determined to have been the murder weapon. The 22-year-old was identified by a tattoo on her foot, and there were no signs of sexual assault. Six days after the murder, on September 11th, three individuals were identified by the police as potential suspects. However, their names were not made public. In 2015, a 44-year-old security guard for the school named Domingo Coffrey was put on trial for the murder, but was acquitted in December of that year. 
Coffrey's fingerprints had been found on the poker, along with another unidentified set of prints, but the evidence was bungled by the police investigators, who cross-contaminated the fire poker, making it unusable in Coffrey's trial or any future trials. Following this botched attempt at solving the murder, Erica's case grew cold. It wasn't until five years later, in 2020, that it began to receive attention again, when her mother and sister began speaking out about the completely bungled investigation. The two women pointed out that Erica's watch, which had been under the watch of four local law enforcement officers, had gone missing from evidence, that the fire poker had been contaminated, and that the prosecutor on the case was related to Erica's host family, several members of which had been questioned as suspects. Since 2015, the records of four other people who were arrested in connection with the case have been sealed. In a lengthy legal document, Erica's mother noted that 68 errors had been made by the Chilean authorities in regard to her daughter's case, reaching this conclusion after she pored over the 22-year-old's case file and crime scene photographs. In addition, she does not think Coffrey was responsible for her daughter's demise. Police attempted to charge Coffrey again in 2016, but a Chilean court blocked this from going ahead. During this same year, Erica's sister created a petition with the aim of pressuring investigators to reopen the case. She gathered 1,000 signatures. In September, almost six years to the date of her sibling's death, the Chilean authorities agreed to reopen the case. A team of investigators who worked especially on cases pertaining to gender violence took the case on pro bono. Even though law enforcement shelved the case a long time ago, the Chilean media never forgot about the heinous, unsolved murder of Erica Hagen. Over the years, one TV station aired a clip of a recorded conversation between the son of Erica's host family and his ex-boyfriend, who was seen with her on the day of her demise. According to Erica's mother, the ex-boyfriend says, Please tell me you didn't have anything to do with this. There is then a 10 to 15 second pause before the son responds, What do you want me to say? The new investigation into Erica's murder aims to identify direct perpetrators, accomplices, or accessories to the crime, or anyone who colluded to obstruct the investigation. So far, however, the case is still unsolved. The phone number for the team working on Erica's case has not been listed on news reports. If you have any information on her case, you can contact her family on the Facebook page they have set up for the investigation, linked in the description. And there you have the facts. Please leave a comment down below with your own theories and speculations, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching. Stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.